Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 35. I'm very much looking forward to sharing today's guest with you. I met him last year when he volunteered his time to teach two online workshops during International Nature Journaling Week. He's a professional illustrator, author and educator, and I'm speaking about Tim Pond. Tim's book is called The Field Guide to Drawing and Sketching Animals, and it's the most comprehensive book on sketching animals that I've ever come across. Tim dives into the anatomy, evolution and science of the whole animal kingdom from butterflies to blue whales. He gives tools and techniques for being able to confidently capture the life and movement of animal subjects. In our conversation, we talk about how Tim developed as a professional artist and how he's come to be doing the work that he is now. We talk about his artistic style and how he teaches others to see and draw nature. I know you're going to enjoy his perspective on all this. Let's listen. Tim, thank you so much for being here with me. I'm excited to chat with you on the podcast. (laughs) Yeah, me too, Bethan. Yeah, looking forward to this. So I mostly start my interviews by talking about early nature experiences. And I wonder if you had nature in your childhood. Yeah, I grew up in uh, a small village and uh, yeah, we, we had ducks, we had a small little farm, I suppose, uh, ducks, tortoises, rabbits, um, and we were surrounded by nature. We had a large garden and uh, it, it spent a lot of time out in the woods running around with my brothers, really. We didn't mix much with other children because we were so isolated, but yeah, we had a donkey, uh, Jerry. And, uh, (laughs) yeah, I think probably my influences were built upon in an early childhood, you know, a love of nature and being amongst the wild animals and plants and things. And how about art? Were you an artist as a child? (laughs) Yeah, I was always drawn to sketching and painting. I remember at primary school, I, I was selected to paint the scenery for the school play and I was allowed, allowed to come out of... (laughs) <laughs> different science lessons, maths lessons to be able to paint the backdrop for the, uh, oh, <laughs> fantastic. the Christmas play. Um, <laughs> and I used to write my own stories and illustrate them. And uh, yeah, I, I was drawing before I was talking, according to my mother. <laughs> and, and how did that develop? How did you develop into a professional artist? I think it's a different route for everybody finding out where you fit in within the creative industries because... They're so diverse and you're sort of led by your genuine uh, influences and things like that. I, th- I went to art school at a time when it was sort of Damien Hirst and Tracy Emin were all the rage. And I w- didn't really feel I fitted in to that way of working. I enjoyed being creative, but it was a struggle for me to find my direction within quite a conceptual framework of thinking within contemporary art. At school, I didn't go to the greatest school. I went to a secondary school and it wasn't brilliant. It was an all-boys school. And the art room was sort of a refuge. And the art teachers had a sort of passion for their subjects. Their subject, whereas the other teachers didn't seem (laughs) to be really that interested. And I think it was their enthusiasm that that in that environment was just like a little sanctuary, the art room. Mm. And it was a great place to go, uh, a liberal place to go, where you know, new ideas were accepted. So I think from school, I started to spend a lot of time in the art room. Then when I left uh, school, I was thinking about becoming an architect. But I don't know. <laughs> I ended up doing a foundation course, had a very inspirational art teacher called John Thompson, who's still an artist now. And I could really relate to his way of working, his way of thinking. He was really passionate about sketching and painting and illustration. And he was a big influence. Um, And then I think I went through that period at university where I just didn't connect 
with what my teachers wanted of me. Um, so then I left a bit confused about knowing what my direction was. And ultimately, I, I started work, working in museums, actually. I was a museum doing the displays and things like that. Okay. <laughs> I remember my mother saying to me once, you'll, you'll end up becoming a display yourself. You spent so long doing your job. <laughs> Get, get out Mom into the world. Funny things, don't they? <laughs> get out into the world and do something. So, I, I remember seeing an advert on um, on the the time at the time. You know, it was on the tube, and it was an advert to go on an expedition with Rally International. It was it was a, a Prince Charles charity, and I just applied. I thought, oh, well, Mum's maybe right. Maybe I need to go out and see a bit of the world, and so I applied to do that. And curiously. My application was picked up by uh, a, a cartoonist called Leigh Kenyon. Now, it, in the film The Great Escape, the, the character that's Donald Pleasance, plays Donald Pleasance, who's the one who's short-sighted, that was Leigh Kenyon in the real life. So he was actually the real forger oh. in The Real Great Escape. Oh, what? He, he, wasn't using, he wasn't losing his eyesight at all. Uh, uh. And he actually tried to sue, I think he said to me, he tried to sue the film because they're they made him out to be short They misportrayed him. Yeah. <laughs> and he picked up my application and said, do I want to be the artist on wow. this expedition? And so that was such a lucky chance that he saw it and saw that I had done art at, at college and then selected me. And then I went off to Alaska for about five, five months. Tell me about making art in Alaska. So that was great. I mean, I, I think I'd been struggling to find a direction with doing art. I knew I, I liked doing art. I knew I liked drawing and sketching and painting. I just didn't like all the sort of wordy thing about coming up with some deep concept. Mm. I just felt that was that was unnatural to me. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to do it, but just in a natural, simple way. Um, so, yeah, so I was selected to do that. You had to raise sponsorship. So you had to get um, raised £2,000, I think it was at the time to be able to sort of pay towards your food and things like that. I got a flight. I think Richard Branson donated a flight, I seem wow. to remember. And I got all these different... At first, I couldn't get any sponsorship. I couldn't work it out at all. And then eventually I started um, doing all these different things, pavement drawing mm. and doing sort of enterprising things uh, and just small donations uh, and eventually got to the, the total. And then packed my bags, and then I was fortunate. I mean, art, an art shop sponsored me all the art materials at the time. Oh, great. I can't remember their name. Give them a good plug, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> packed my bags and then went off, and we would be there for the whole of the summer. It was an incredible experience. And I really concentrated on watercolour painting mm -hmm. in the field. Um, but, you know, in certain conditions, you would just... I wouldn't sketch with a pencil, because sometimes you're in glaciers you would have different projects that you would go on and sometimes you'd have to have to melt snow oh at, my in, goodness. you know for the water and then yeah. just draw straight in with the brush on the watercolor paper and make loads and loads of really quick notes because obviously you're moving around a lot mm -mm. yeah wow that must have been such a big adventure was that your first trip overseas yeah, that was my first and best and biggest adventure if I'm honest I think it was <laughs> it was five months it changed me uh, radically because yeah. I, I remember the first day there was various programs they were split into two week projects so there was be a trekking program there would be a building a, a cabin program for disabled kayakers mm. there'd be a glacier program where you'd actually spend two or three weeks up in the mountains living on a glacier um and there'd be a, ki a, a kayaking program where you kayak all the way from Whittier down the Prince William Sound to you get to the the ocean and all the killer whales and wolves and just living with the wild. Um, and then obviously just any little spare moment I had mm. to make the sketches. And yeah, when I came back from that, I had publishers that were interested in them. And that started me down the route of seeing my artwork rather than having to put it in a, an art gallery and hoping someone yes. would buy it. I, I sort of started to make the link. I could make my sketches and paintings and then I like doing the writing and then combine those two and put them in magazines and books. And then that's when I started to see that as an opportunity, a creative outlet for me, you know, with my creative work. Yeah. Yes. And 
You've published an amazing reference book. It's the Field Guide to Drawing and Sketching Animals. It's filled with pages detailing representatives from the entire animal kingdom, from sea sponges to whales, elephants, invertebrates. And it's also packed with information about each animal, how it moves, where it lives, what it eats, how it evolved. It's an incredible resource and I, I'll put a link to your book in the show notes for this episode so people can find it. Tell me about the book. Tell me about how you came to create this beautiful book. Hmm. Thanks. Um, so this one, I was teaching at London Zoo. So we used to do... Oh, what happened? I, I went on an, another expedition to Costa Rica. This is the story. And I went with the same charity uh, rally. Uh, this time they said, would you like to be the photographer? Okay. Um, because we don't really have... They, unfortunately, rather done away with the field artist. <laughs> That's pretty bad, isn't it? <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, so I said, well, I'll go and take the photographs then. Um, and then I had to raise the sponsorship again. And then so I said to London Zoo, I, could I come and sketch your animals and I'll turn them into prints and then we could sell them to raise money mm. for this charity. And the, it was a big conservation expedition. And um, when I came back, the organiser said, would you like to teach here? So I started teaching once a month at London Zoo. And I started out with just doing the normal art teaching, what I call the normal art teaching, line, sh tone, shading, proportions, you know, things like that. Yeah. And then we were concentrating on four species a month. And that gave me every weekend, I'd start finding out a bit more about lemurs or understanding how they've <laughs> evolved or something more about their anatomy. And so each lesson would go a little bit further than, and my understanding about that, that species would develop. Mm -hmm. So that went on for a year or so. And then the program, you know, changed and they finished with that program. And I thought, well, I've got all these notes. I've got all yes, this, a this stack year, of notes. Yeah, a year of research into elephants and things I'd found <laughs> out along the way uh, about, you know, how crocodiles evolved and things like that. And um, I thought, well, I want to put this towards something. So then I approached a publisher and two days later they just said, yes, we'll, We'll put them Fantastic. On to I mean, I had things on my side. I mean, I had London Zoo on my side. Uh, yes, it's very okay. difficult <laughs> to get books published. I don't want to get lots of people's <laughs> hopes up because it is such a difficult industry, publishing. But uh, if you've got the right product <laughs> and you, you meet the right publisher and get the right fit between the two of you, and it's really about that relationship, uh, then you, you can, you know, non-fiction is easier to publish than the publishing fiction, which is a really tough job. Mm-mm. So, yeah, and then I began that and I was doing classes with owls, uh, you know, in, in my college. We'd just open the studio in the evening and we would have people from the film industry coming, working on movies. And they'd ask me about really precise anatomy. How many tail feathers has it got? How many primaries? How many secondaries? Getting really exact for mm. animals that appeared in uh, feature movies um, where they do the anatomy, uh, the CGI, an incredible level and I'd show them with a, <laughs> a simple coloured pencil and then you'd come back and see what the hell they did it uh, on the computer made it look like it was a real living animal inside the computer itself oh yeah that stuff is amazing isn't it that sort of computer generated movement and yeah so b because of that I they were asking quite technical questions so that sort of pushed me a little bit towards technical things that I knew that they all wanted a reference book where they could understand how to rig up an animal with the anatomy and the muscles and so okay I, I on certain animals I mean it's really helpful if they're not very uh, furry basically you know, on a bear <laughs> um you know it's got a lot of hair I don't think there's a great deal of purpose really learning the muscle anatomy um it certainly hel helps to understand where the pivot points are um mm. but on certain animals like horses and dogs a little bit of anatomical knowledge can really uh, give you the edge with your shading of in your grooves on the surface of the animal to help give that sort of expressive quality. Um, it it went out of fashion. I mean, it went out of fashion. I think knowing what you were looking at in the nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties, because I think people were kind of projecting too much of what they knew and what they were looking at, and they, so it's now come back into fashion uh, because of the film industry. And so I thought, well, I'm going to go along with it. And yeah. I was also doing a lot of teaching um, 
or helping out, I should say, at the, at the Royal Veterinary College. And um, I was then sort of being asked to do quite technical things with some of the students like about skull. We did one last week on skull morphology and understanding how if you pick a skull up when you're walking in the woods, how you could understand what animal it is by mm. looking at its teeth and its eyes and things like that. And so I, I was doing that quite technical thing. So I just brought that into the book as well. And I thought it was something a bit different yes. from other animal books. And because of the way th the earth works, the earth system, we, how we need all the animals in this biome uh, to, you know, the insects, not only do they feed the birds, um, but they aerate, aerate the soil and they, they sort of break down leaf material. Um, but they have a whole function within the biome. So I just thought, well, we'll look at everything. We'll try and look as much as we can yeah. and make each animal equal on an equal footing. That was the attempt. Yeah, that's what I love about yeah. the book because it's so inclusive. It's just like a blue whale or an invertebrate or the whole the whole thing. It's so inclusive. It's so like, let's study the entirety of the animals <laughs> on Earth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Because often you get um, people say you can only draw what you see. But it's almost a bit of a shame. I, I, I've never seen a blue whale and I, I may never see yeah. a blue whale in my life, but it's a bit of a yes. shame not to draw them. Um, from using a variety of photographic reference. Yeah, and I think people enjoy enjoy that. I, yeah. I loved um, your... So for International Nature Journaling Week last year, you did a skull talk, and yeah. you had this beautiful way of describing an animal by looking at its structure. And, and it's so obvious when... It was so obvious when you said it, but it's not something I had considered before. But so in the in the skull of an animal that is in water, the eye sockets are going to be on the top so that the the animal yeah. is is seeing out of... You're seeing, yeah. We had beavers, didn't we? We had a beaver yes. skull. Yes, and there the and eyes you... of a... Yeah, sorry, I'm interrupting you. No, I was no, thinking no. about the eyes of the, um, of the animal who is grazing, has to have eyes at the side so that it can see what's coming up. Yeah, yeah, you can read a skull. So um, there's lots you can learn just by picking something up. Um, beavers are fascinating that they've got their eyes on top of the head and you can see these very wide flared, what's called zygomatic arches, which allow muscles from the, what's called the sagittal crest to go and attach to the jaw to allow industrial processing because they can mm. cut down a tree with their face, can't they? <laughs> and they have <laughs> iron, they have this very thick layer of iron, which is orange, in the front of their teeth. So the dentine is impregnated with iron. So every time they bite, the back of oh. the teeth wears down quicker. So it's self sharpen self sharpening chainsaw, analog chainsaw. Isn't nature the, incredible? <laughs> it is incredible, yeah. Um but they're a rodent, you know, they're rodents adapted to an aquatic habitat, a semi aquatic, and they 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 can be uh, habitat engineers as well. But there's so much you can learn um with a with a herbivore. Yes, the animal, the eyes tend to be on the side, um, and uh, the predator tends to have the eyes facing forward. So where mm -hmm. the eyes overlap, you get stereoscopic vision. So the predator can judge how far away the um, prey is. It doesn't work. It works very much on land uh, okay. with with uh, mammals on land. It doesn't work particularly in the ocean when you get killer whales and things like that. So obviously, it's impossible <laughs> for the morphology of the eyes to go on the front. Um, <laughs> But it, it, yeah, eyes on the, eyes on the front. The animal hunts. Eyes on the side. The animal hides. That's what they tend to say. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you can tell a lot by the teeth as well. So the teeth can give you fascinating details. There's a, a crab eater seal or leopard seal that don't really eat. Uh, a crab eater seal doesn't really eat crab. It eats krill, and it actually has teeth that are like sieves, tricuspid shapes, and it can actually squirt the water out. And so teeth can be evolved uh, into all sorts of amazing things. There's an iguana that's also got teeth which are, are like a tricuspid, again, for scraping algae off the rock. So wow. teeth and really interesting at understanding the food that the animal eats. Mm. Mm. Oh, super cool. Mm. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> I'd love to talk about your um, techniques and your style you manage to create sketches that have this incredible freedom and movement in them and at the same time real technical precision and 
I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, how you bring these two things together, like technical precision, like impeccable perspective and all that, and still lots of freedom, lots of movement. Hmm. I don't know. It's a, uh, well, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I think I spend a lot, of, a lot of time drawing itself, sketching, and I think, mm -hmm. I suppose, just thinking back at how I learned to draw, um, I think one of the things that was really good was, was going back to that teacher I mentioned at the foundation course, he would come and draw on your drawings and then you would okay. move around and it'll work. It wouldn't be precious. It'd be like, he would yep. come, come and have a go and it's like, you move over there, have a go on that person's drawing. Mm, and then okay. you would sort of learn from this combined effort. I found that really uh, useful. And then of course, when I finished art school, I used to do pavement drawing and just copying the old masters and chalk on the pavement. And that actually was a, a very good, period of freeing up and becoming unself-conscious about your drawing. I think before that, drawing on the pavements, if someone looked over your shoulder, you'd be oh, stop looking at what I'm doing. Yes. I'm not confident <laughs> uh, with my mark yep. making yet. But that really kicked that out of me. Mm. And then I suppose later on, I became a cartoonist, a political cartoonist for uh, the Guardian newspaper for three years. Wow. And so on a Saturday, I mean, that's it. So on a Thursday night, you'd do this sketch, and then <laughs> on a Saturday, you'd be sitting on the tube, and the newspaper would open up, and it was on the back oh, of the garden. Oh, fun! And then you'd see this row of your pictures, and then by the end of Saturday night, you'd just see your drawing on the floor, and everyone just walking on it. <laughs> well, that, that, all those things stop you from being precious, I think. And yes. um, with the Guardian one, that was dip pen and ink, and so you were trying to sort of be, you know, doing a. George W. Bush, I think it was at the time, or <laughs> something like that, and then trying to sort of bite into the, the character of the form, but express the George W. Bushness of his character mm -hmm. and look for that, those specific things. So that was sort of quite an interesting kind of period, I think, of just looking and trying to exaggerate and capture the character of certain individuals. It's quite, quite difficult to do, actually. Um, but then, of course, that late night practice with the dip pen and ink when you were... yeah going out with some Diana monkeys, you're sort of doing the same thing, trying to get the Diana-ness of a Diana monkey, and you're trying to capture uh, its kind of essence, in a way, um, as quickly as you can. And that speed I had to do with the newspapers um, was a really good training ground, I think. Uh, yes, so... I, I don't know much about politics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know a bit about politics, I shouldn't say that, but the, in, the, in the cartooning world... The, the political cartoonists do, when they meet up, talk politics all the time. What do you think about this? Yes, what okay. Yeah, yeah. And they're very well researched. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting scene. <laughs> so the freedom comes from ditching the perfection, just letting, cutting loose and just not being precious about it. And the technical skill comes, I guess, just from doing it, doing a lot of pencil miles, as doing John Mueller would say. Yeah, John, John Mueller's. That's brilliant, isn't he? <laughs> um, what's, there's a phrase, I think, I can't remember who it is. Um, you don't want any technical difficulties to remove your observation from the page. You just want to get into the flow and uh, not have anything technical in your mind almost. But what I wanted with that book was to have the double page spread. So if you did want to know, oh, where's the gastrolemus muscle? Where because that's quite a good one, isn't it? Um, so you put that in, you could just open and look at that book at the time and go, oh, I know that's there. So that what, I'm, what am I looking at? Or particularly the case, you know, if an animal's in long grass, how many claws and paws has it got? Um, and those sort of just things that, so you could get into the flow without worrying about technical difficulties. It's, you do find yourself when you're sketching an animal you haven't sketched before, uh, and you can't see its feet or whatever it is. Do you find yourself wondering, drawing, going, how many toes has it got? Yes. Uh, it could be really <laughs> nagging at the back of your brain and something to just get rid of that. It's like trying to remember an actor in a film. It's just like bug, bug, bugging me. I can't work that out. I can't see that part. <laughs> and I was drawing a tapir, I think it was, and I couldn't see its toes. And I, uh, Just something quick to solve it so that you know how many toes it's got on the front and the back. It's just things like that. Or where the muscles are. It's, I mean, there's about five muscles you need to know, seven, eight at the most for artists, really. There's not a great deal um, of anatomy you really need to just show the pronounced, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. just what, you know, one in the neck with triceps and the extensors and a few on the back leg. Um, yeah, that's really kind of what you need. Mm. 
let's talk about perspective because perspective drawing is something that people usually associate with architecture or technical drawing but you talk about perspective in your book and I feel like formal perspective can be intimidating for beginners and I'm wondering how you simplify perspective and make it accessible for students and because it can really help when you're uh, you have a page in the book and it's um, looking at um, a sea turtle from above and below and it's really um, wonderfully illustrates how perspective can be really important in nature illustration as well but I'm wondering about like allowing or facilitating beginners to access perspective because it can be intimidating. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's funny because I teach or run the only A-level in architecture in the country at my college. Um, wow. So, of course, I'm a little bit biased towards perspective. Um, <laughs> and, of course, if an animal is quite boxy, like a sea turtle, then in terms of your visualis- visualisation skills, putting it in a framework um, is really useful, particularly now with artists and cartoonists or concept artists that are working in the film industry. They are they are drawing in perspective so that it enables the person that's then going to render it on the computer to conceive of it as a as a as a, as a movable 3d mm-hmm. form um so yeah so, so it's really just using the framework to sort of articulate the object within it um you can use it on many different animals um i'm just trying to think particularly as i say for example i was sketching with a friend of mine um uh, she's a great marine biologist, by the way, who combines art and drawing. Lizzie Mills, marine mumbles. I'll give her a plug. <laughs> we love oh. Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, you know Lizzie, yeah. Yeah, she's um, been on the podcast. <laughs> we were out sketching at the aquarium, and you know, we had we were with the the sea turtles, and we were using this perspective method as whether the the sea turtle was swimming beneath us or whether it was going below you, mm. and by sort of it would the moments would last shorter than the amount mm-hmm. of time it took to sketch it. Yes. So having this quick way of kind of like, if that's there, therefore mm. the flippers must be there and then the back flippers attach here and the head comes mm-hmm. out down the bilateral line of symmetry, down this sort of symmetrical form. And having that quick kind of go-to kind of perspective framework is really, really useful. And also things like you talked about the blue whale. Well, you know, we, we want to do a blue whale, but we don't want to just copy a photograph. We want to create mm. from... A range of photographs and a sort of a combination of those and create our blue whale and look at it from a certain perspective so that way you could have like four i think i did my blue whale from four or five photos and then reconstruct it in a mm. in a perspective coming towards you so you get that drama um but it's a yeah perspective in itself is a really powerful tool at developing um your ability to conceive of things so if I, I think I was with some gorillas in in Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle and uh, just kind of having this box framework, almost in perspective of the skull and then a, a, a big loop on top of that box for the sagittal crest and then a, a, a sort of tube for the ridge brow and then a, cent- a muzzle coming out. And having that in my head, then I could apply that to looking at the gorilla um, in front of me and it just really helped get the gorilla-ness out of the the face. So, yes. yeah, perspective can be kind of really enabling animals you wouldn't initially think it would help. Uh, yeah, so... Do um, you want to tell me... that This is a, maybe a good time to talk about it. I was going to ask you about what you call widgets and gizmos. <laughs> I'd love for you to describe widgets and gizmos and how you came to these. Yeah, well, I made them up. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> that is very good. cool. I was just teaching and... When people wanted to get to the heart of something, um, how to draw it, or they was, you know, they were stuck, and then it's knowing like a, like a duck's got a cheat, a cheek, or how to do a dog's paw so that the two paws at the front are in f- are in front of the two ones behind by doing a sort of simple pentagram and then dividing it with a cross. Those are sort of simple devices that can really help you get it look like it looks. Um, yeah. The widget, I coined the phrase of the 3D framework, <laughs> which is the fundamentals of form of things like uh, g- gorillas, a gorilla's head or a, a mm-hmm. seashell or so, anything you're drawing. And so when I would go around my class and say, 
to get to the fundamental of what you're doing, the fundamental sort of framework, I would say, well, let's do a quick widget of that. So what, <laughs> what is the essence uh, of, of it? Um, so a shark might be a, an oval with two, uh, two kind of triangles at the end. That might be the sort of fundamental of it. Um, so, yeah, so I would just go around and I would do loads of these and then people found them really enabling. Yeah. Um, and so I've seen a lot of concept artists in on the West Coast of California doing them in their teaching when they were teaching mm -hmm. various how to draw various things. It was like, this is fundamentally what it is. And then let's apply the additional detail. Mm -hmm. And it does stop that sort of there's a thing amongst wildlife art where people copy every hair and sit down and yeah. dedicate themselves quite painstakingly to do it. I mean, I admire it. Yes. But I couldn't do it. But they yeah. literally get every single hair and they go back and it ends up just being like a photograph. A photograph, yes. Yeah, and it doesn't have any 3D quality to it. But using the mm. widget uh, helps you get it to look 3D um, and stops it just being like a flat rendering of a photograph. And the, the yeah, and the gizmo sort of thing, that there's just like if you... It's like a sort of flat version of the widget, really. It's just like, this is the fundamentally what we're looking at. You can break this up like with this simple diagram. Yeah. Yes. It's a really handy thing. So simple shapes that you can keep in your mind and pull out when you're at the aquarium and something's moving mm. quickly or your subject, your gorilla has got up and walked to a new position. You can reimagine uh, yeah. the widget in a new position. That's exactly it, yeah. And particularly like you've got a fish coming towards you and you can imagine the fish almost cut up into slices yes. like a tin of tuna or whatever. Then you have the body shape and then the tail shape and then the head fitting on. So going nose to tail, kind of I find that really useful. Also starting flat as a flat view left to right of a fish and then as you're spending time with it, getting more and more mm. ambitious looking at uh, different angles and trying to get it in perspective coming towards you and, and things mm. like that and I find that it's very useful to a very useful tool to have that I just had this image of you walking around in the world uh, interacting with people and <laughs> <laughs> overlaying the the widgets on people's faces <laughs> imagining them as c cylinders or whatever <laughs> do you do that do you have do you imagine shapes over the I mean, real I think, world I think you do when you draw something new I don't tend to do it um <laughs> <laughs> without a pencil in my hand um but uh yeah when you draw something new i do find it it's usually what i do at the beginning of a class or someone sitting there i don't know how to start and then well how do, how do i start well this is fundamentally mm -hmm. what you're looking at this is really what the essence is this is kind of let's do a, a widget or a gizmo of it and now we'll build on that that sort of framework yeah. um yeah so i like I, that I, as a way yeah. just to break into it because it can be Starting can be a really difficult thing, can't it? But this could help you break break into it. Yeah, it does help you break into it. And, of course, it helps you with anatomy. So if you're going to be doing a, a squid or something like that and it's got its two uh, long sort of tentacle arms coming out and then how many uh, other arms it's got and where the mantle is and mm. where the head is and where, even where the brain and the eyes are, and then you, can, you actually can understand the anatomy of what you're looking at, even though it's very gelatinous in the water. And then how... How can you break it down? Where do the, is there a bilateral line of symmetry on an octopus or does one of the tentacles come out like a nose? Well, no, they're separate either side of it and you could cut it down the middle and have four tentacles on either side of, of the octopus. So yes. even when things are very fluid like that, you do want to get it right. And so this very kind of simplistic way of breaking something down can really be powerful, I think, and, and help to get dra drama in it as well. Yes, mm. your your work really has drama. Like like I said, it's super technical, but it's actually got so much life and movement in it. That's what I love about it. <laughs> Tell me about your favourite tools. What are your favourite materials for sketching? Yeah, so I mean, I'm a big fan of um, dip pen and ink. That's very sort of expressive. Mm -hmm. um, I use a, a Francois Gillot 303 nib and... Uh, an ink that's called Magic Black, and I'm just trying to think <laughs> um, who makes it. Um, but the very, very black, Magic Black ink, which is really nice. Um, I use light grey markers, one and two, so just just for shading, just yeah, just mm -hmm. just for the speed of it. 
um, because when you're in the field, you don't want to spend ages shading. So you just want to yes. be able to put the shading in with markers. I don't like graphite pencil at all. I never really draw with graphite. I find I have probably had associations with learning to draw with graphite. Okay. So to break away from that, I tend to use Faber-Castell polychromos mm-hmm. Prussian blue pencil. That's a great okay. pencil. So um, that's what you use to for your initial sketch? Yeah, mostly. Mostly I'd sketch in, even when I'm demonstrating with students, mostly I'd demonstrate with a colouring pencil and mm-hmm. pick a colouring pencil that relates to the subject. So if you're yes. drawing a lion, you might be using a dark brown pencil, um, something like that. So I tend to try and connect with the colour of the pelt of the animal mm-hmm. I've got in front of me with the colour of the colouring pencil. Uh, watercolour, of course. Uh, I just use material that you can use at home, you can use it's quick, it doesn't kind of get the furniture covered in oil paint. Um, <laughs> and I use this brand called Sennelier. Mm-hmm. So it's like a, they use honey in the watercolour, which gives it a really nice um, texture. I've been using Windsor Newton till about five years ago, till I discovered Sennelier. I, I do recommend, but <laughs> I'm not sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what you like about them above it's, the other brands. It's softer. It seems to okay. be a softer paint. It doesn't seem to be quite so granular. It seems to be less sandy. I can't quite explain it. It just seems mm. to be more, yeah, like it's a so- softer. It might, maybe it's the honey that they use mm. as the binder. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But those are the things. I tend to just use thick cartridge paper. I don't mm-hmm. really use watercolour paper I'd use for sketching in the field, for landscapes on expedition and things like that. But primarily I just use a thick cartridge, particularly for mm-hmm. the, the animal work. And your watercolour yeah. straight on that? Yeah. Yeah, oh, just interesting. A 200 GSM, a really thick cartridge. It's a lot, lot cheaper. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, you're and, right. Watercolour um, paper's not cheap. It, yeah, <laughs> and you can't get that much detail out of watercolour paper. Mm, interesting. I've seen you create beautiful finished illustrations by overlaying a digitally created texture onto a traditional sketch. And I'd love to talk with you about how do you combine the traditional and the digital in your work? I think it's partly my job. I came to teach at the college as an art teacher and when I was interviewed they gave me the job and afterwards they said oh you've got to run the graphics department we forgot to tell you. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So you've got to learn the computers. Uh And so I didn't know anything about digital art, Photoshop or InDesign or any of the other computer programs I teach. So I taught myself and then Obviously, with my interest in, in publishing and taking my artwork into get it published rather than an art gallery wall, mm. um, the, adjusting your own images and smartening them up in Photoshop and cleaning them up and preparing them for professional print production actually made the work look quite good <laughs> um, <laughs> compared with what it actually looks like in the drawer when you've just got piles and piles of sketches that you never ever look through. And having it digital makes it much more manageable. Yes. Um, to actually look through and see what you've done. Particularly when putting books together, you can make kind of associations of where one file can go against another because you've got them all digitally. So I found that you could flatter things like that. And then I suppose I was just experimenting a little bit. I mean, I think you're talking about putting the dappled light on a shark, maybe. Yes. I think that's what, yeah. I, <laughs> what I was playing with. And I just splatted... Uh, I just wanted to see how you could make the shark look like it had dappled light on it. So I just took gouache paint, flicked it on a black piece of cardboard, then scanned it in, and then just in Photoshop, just moulded it over the top of the, mm. the shark. It was just curiosity of seeing what, what you could do, really, to use the computer as, as an art tool. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I love I, that. I love how yeah. it's... People are now using it. It's not just, I'm not just a digital artist or a traditional artist, but they're, it's fluid. You can move between the two. You can combine the two in beautiful you ways. Run, yeah, you can, yeah. I mean, we can see a lot of concept artists doing yeah, breathtaking work um, for the, the film industry and the gaming industry. Mm. And I think partly because a lot of my students now go on to work in that industry. Um, I'm trying to keep up <laughs> as best I can with <laughs> the speed at which some of them are moving at with the technologies. Um, but I, I'm always learning. I'm, I'm studying Premiere Pro today. To, um, yeah. Oh, that's a big learning 
curve, curve isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yep, I thought about learning that too, and I got scared and <laughs> stopped. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just so useful at the moment with the lockdown. Yes, to create totally. Films and uh, yeah, I've been finding films really good for the students, so they can stop and pause them. Mm. So um, when we're teaching, and uh, I, I teach now with a camera, and I demonstrate drawing with the. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a company called Hugh gave me a lovely HD camera to teach with. Um, and so uh, I've been using that in my classes, mm. which has been good. Uh, so your classes are online now because of COVID? Is yeah, because right? so of COVID. So what I've uh, what I've been doing is I actually have a, a station set up with a camera. Mm -hmm. so the document the, camera. Yeah. So students became blind to what I was doing or what I was trying to show them. So I would have that. And then when I needed a break from teaching, I would put on a relative video on YouTube mm -hmm, or something like mm -hmm. that. And then they would stop and study that for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever it was. Then they come back to my teaching. So I was finding mm -hmm. that having this bank of videos was really important because actually mm -hmm. teaching online can be intense, if not more so than yes. in the real class, because you can't go off and yes. get a cup of tea. Um, yeah. but, <laughs> but then everyone watch this video for 20 minutes, come back, and then you can apply the learning to, 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 to the next part of the session. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's amazing isn't it this new world and all the things you have to do all the things you have to learn to adapt to it <laughs> yeah. being creative so that you can communicate I think with the audience yes yeah. yeah I'm interested in your love of animals and I find that some people are plant people and some people are animal people tell me about animals what you what draws you to them over other subjects yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? And I think as a child, I was, I think a lot of our, our character traits, our passions when we're very young, kind of slightly shape the shape of our lives and what we actually end up doing. And as a child, I was just bewitched, I think, by uh, animals at the zoo. I would never want to leave mm. or rock pooling. I would just be there for hours um, uh, crying <laughs> we're going to have to leave and, when you leave yeah yeah and then just seeing the new animals uh it always has just a kind of very powerful impression on me i was recently i just about 2 years ago i saw a maasai giraffe and i'd never seen a maasai giraffe before and it was just magical it had that effect on me when i of seeing a new animal when i was young it had a completely different pattern on its on its, wow. on its pelt and it was just like wow um, yeah. just even that thrill of the excitement of seeing a new species or seeing like this blue bird out the corner of your eye and that is a genuine thrill i think for mm -hmm. me um and having the opportunity to spend time with them and get to know each animal at an enclosure um yeah i just generally enjoy it i just find it really interesting and um a fascinating experience to try and get the character of what you're looking at down on the paper uh, it's a sort of adventure, I think. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I do have a genuine passion for animals, but I don't have any pets. <laughs> Which, uh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm a bit odd. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I just don't know. Um, but it's been with me all my life. Yeah. yeah. It, your story reminded me of going to the Auckland Zoo once and they have this... Um, sort of walkway that you're above the enclosure and you're looking down and you're looking down I just remember seeing the giraffes looking down on the giraffes and there was that moment and I guess I maybe it was the first time I'd seen a giraffe in in the flesh I, hmm. I'm not sure but I was just like mesmerized by it they were so big compared to what I had imagined and and that there was this animal that existed that was moving and alive and yet enormous and majestic. And, I, I, yeah, I was just mesmerised. It sounds like the same experience. Yeah, they're, they're incredible. Incredible <laughs> bits of anatomy, aren't they, giraffes? Yeah. I think we had yeah. a, a metatarsal or metacarpal from, which is the, the bone in the middle of your hand. And it's mm -hmm. uh, the length of my leg. <laughs> and when yeah, I ask yeah. people... <laughs> what bone it was it's like this metacarpal metatarsal i can't remember which one wow but they are incredible things the way they're put together and to see them in africa running on the, the plains mm. in the serengeti it's uh that it, it is just another thing isn't it it is just absolutely amazing when they're in herds and you see them like 
going and charging across the, the grasslands, the savannas. Wow. Uh, yes, they are remarkable, remarkable creatures. Do you have a favourite animal to sketch? Well, it was actually the giraffe. The giraffe yeah. was... All, I always liked the giraffes because they, were, yeah. they would stand fairly still and they've got those beautiful shapes, the ossicones on top yes. of the head, and they've got this sort of arabesque shape down the nose and under the muzzle, and this incredibly long neck, obviously, and those very powerful pelvic muscles and the really powerful anatomy to get into um so that and that and penguins were always mm. a, always a favorite <laughs> i think <laughs> um, <laughs> and then yeah i always got a, like drawing monkeys too yeah. but the, so they can it depends on which species some of them are very very fast um, <laughs> <laughs> oh wow i'm interested in how you access nature where you are what does nature look like around you and maybe um maybe the zoo is a big source of nature for you yeah, I mean, I live on a, a a big park called Richmond Park. I overlook the park, and I think I chose to buy here and live here. Uh, it's very quiet, um, so yes. I go straight out, and then I'm, I'm straight into the the Royal Park, which is the I think the biggest Royal Park in in the UK. It's full of fallow deer and red deer. Oh wow! So I quite go, enjoy going out and sketching those. We have. I came home one evening and had a. I thought I had a burglar because everything was knocked off the shelf. The toilet paper was chucked down the toilet. What? Uh, but yeah, the, the, all the doors were locked, all the windows were down. Uh, started to believe, you know, maybe there was uh, um, ghosts. <laughs> and I came into the lounge and I couldn't hear it, I couldn't see anything. And then 10 minutes later I heard this sound and it was a green parrot uh, no. sitting on the, uh, one of the lights. I come, come down the chimney. <laughs> Are you uh, for real? Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't get it out for ages. What did you do? <laughs> it, 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 it liked the calendar when I was cooking and it used to sit up there. I mean, it went out in the evening after a couple of hours, but it just wouldn't... It wasn't that... It seemed that scared. Wow. So that's nature okay, coming Okay, so you have nature close by. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're called they're cavity nesters, these ring-necked parakeets. Um, they're from the Him Himalayas, but they're, they come down the chimney to, to do cavity nesting. Um, but there's a lot out there. There's a lot of, uh, um, I have a lot of long-tailed tits here, which are um, beautiful birds. Uh, we see nuthatches and uh, what else have we got in there? There's, there's, a, there's a lot of wildlife just mm. outside my window. Oh, very special. And I do sit in the park and sketch and do landscapes as well. Of it, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm so interested to hear all this backstory about your career. So you've done so many different things. You've been a political cartoonist. You worked at the zoo. You've done. You've been an expeditionary artist, an author, an art teacher. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any advice for people listening who want to piece together an art career that doesn't involve exhibiting in in a gallery in the way that you have. Do you have any advice, or was it more organic than that? Just moving from thing to thing do you can you summarize think, your think, technique well, for yeah. creating a career <laughs> creating a career um <laughs> well i think my real career is teaching and i think mm. that the creative work i do in publishing is is like a part time if mm -hmm. i'm honest and even when i was doing the the, the the guardian newspapering it's always i've always seen it as a bit of a supporting sideline okay mm -hmm. um it is very difficult to make a, a substantial income through doing additional artwork but you can make a little bit you know you can make mm. uh, books actually are fairly good but the, that one the one i just did is in now six countries now and so oh, each country it, 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 it makes more than i <laughs> i'm not going to say but it, it's better than i <laughs> possibly imagined um yeah. but uh i think everybody can find a place within the creative industry um just drawing on your own natural interests um you know it might be that you've got a passion for automobiles or something like that and just through your love of doing that you might find some sort of creative opportunities within it mm -hmm. i didn't fit in at art school i didn't fit into the general expectation of what being a creative was at the time um but through just following my own natural inclinations i think i've ended up doing uh, finding a place for myself uh, which is quite connected with biology. It's interesting, mm. it's quite a sort of crossover between biology and art and <laughs> architecture. So we're mixing it all together. But yeah. try, trying to be honest, I think, 
trying to find an, on, an honest way of doing it. Mm, I think um, new technology, the internet, all these different avenues for sort of displaying your work is wonderful for that as well because people find you, you know, if you sort of put yourself out there, people find you and opportunities come, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I think it's curious. I think being open to the changing, uh, the unique changing uh, future of the creative industries, mm. um, particularly things like concept art, uh, the film industry, gaming and things like that. Uh, mm. A lot of students who are working in that industry full time doing character creation or um, they come to my classes in the evening. We might be learning the anatomy of an owl or a chicken. I think we did once. Um, uh, <laughs> But they want to know all the technical details. But then they've got a job. And I say, what, what do you do during the day? I say, I, I create monsters. I say, oh, you got a job creating <laughs> monsters. <laughs> yeah, I'm a monster creator. And I didn't know that That's was a, a career these days. But then they're still doing their own natural artwork in their spare time. Yes. Besides all the, the, the work they're doing for the film or the gaming industry, they're still doing their own practice. Mm. Um, I, I think one of the things is to always be modest in it if when you're given opportunities to accept them and not turn them down mm. and to mm. do things with the local newspaper local magazines um doesn't matter how small um just just always accept the work and get things done and uh, I, I spent a long time as an architectural illustrator doing work for uh, architects and developments and refurbishments mm. and things like that the, the artwork for the hoardings Okay. And um, that was just being enterprising. I would just make a fl yes. flyer up and put it through the architect's doors and people's doors, and then I would get uh, quite a lot of commissions doing that. Um, I think it's being enterprising, looking for opportunities, yes. and not giving up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Oh, Tim, it's been amazing to chat with you. It's been so good to go into your history and the stories and the techniques and the. The whole thing. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much for chatting with me. This is great. <laughs> really enjoyed it, Bethan. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Tim. I love how he brings a lot of technical and scientific knowledge to the conversation, but he makes it feel exciting and accessible instead of daunting. His book is like this too. It's full of information, but very engaging, and it just makes you want to read more and more and more about the animal kingdom. If you'd like to learn more about Tim and his work, you can visit timpond.co.uk. I'm excited to let you know also that Tim will be joining us again this year for International Nature Journaling Week. Tim will give a workshop on June 1st called Fill Your Nature Journal with Hand-Drawn Lettering. You can visit naturejournalingweek.com to find out more about this. This year for International Nature Journaling Week, we're going to have two live classes every day. I'm so excited about how the plans are coming together. People from around the world have been sharing videos of themselves answering the question, what does nature journaling mean to you? Each video is talking about how much nature connection and nature journaling has touched people. It shows that the joys and benefits of nature journaling are universal. The videos are up on the International Nature Journaling Week website and you can visit the page to watch them. You can find the link in the show notes for this episode to get to that page. If you'd like to share a video of yourself answering this question, what does nature journaling mean to you, please email me. I'd love to share it on their website. I'd like to remind you also that you can support the Journaling with Nature podcast by giving it a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. This can help reach more people and share nature journaling with a wider audience. You can also support the podcast by going to patreon.com forward slash journaling with nature and pledge a small donation there. Your support means the world and it helps make this project sustainable in the long term. So thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.